Welcome to the second in a series of Zoom presentations. I'm Melanie Bell, president of the Cheney Spokane chapter. Uh, Bruce Bornstad, your presenter tonight, is a licensed geologist slash hydrogeologist and retired uh, senior research scientist from Battelle's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He graduated with a degree in geology from the University of New Hampshire and from Eastern Washington University, he received a master's degree in geology. So over the last 40 years, he's written guidebooks on the Ice Age floods that transformed the Pacific Northwest. And they're sold through the bookstore on the Ice Age Floods Institute website and also other stores, Amazon, different places. Um, He's written several books. Uh, one of them is On the Trail of the Ice Age Floods, The Northern Reaches with Dr. Gene Kiever, who was his master teacher. So Bruce was Dr. Gene Kiever. Many of you know Dr. Gene Kiever. Uh, he was one of um, uh, Dr. Gene Kiever's prime uh, favorite students. Or, um, and then uh, Gene, uh, then <clears throat> Bruce, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Gene, uh, Bruce also wrote on the trail of the Ice Age floods. So on behalf of the board of directors, I present to you, Bruce Bornstead. All right, well, thank you, Melody. Thank you, uh, Chris, for uh, helping us with this presentation as well. So I'm gonna go into share screen and then uh, we'll open up the, the PowerPoint presentation. So, uh, this is Dry Falls, uh, one of the, this is like perhaps the iconic location for the Ice Age floods uh, here in the Pacific Northwest. Probably more people are familiar with this feature, this flood feature than any others, but you know, the floods covered a huge area, not just dry, not just Grand Coulee, uh, but they, you know, they started all the way up in Northwestern Montana. And we see features from the floods going all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. So that's 600 miles in length and in places it's up to 100 miles wide, the, uh, the paths of these ice age floods. So I'm gonna be uh, sharing, you, sharing with you a lot of aerial images that I've taken over the years, uh, both with a fixed wing airplane, like this picture was taken. I took this before I got my drone and now I have a drone and I can get uh, lots of other pictures similar to, similar to this of other flood features. But the advantage of the drone is it doesn't cost anything except for the initial investment. And it doesn't cost hundreds of hours, uh, hundred, hundreds of dollars per hour <clears throat> to fly an airplane. So I'm much uh, more able to get a lot more uh, video with, these, uh, with the drone. Okay, the uh, Ice Age floods in the Pacific Northwest uh, came from three different locations. And most, most everyone is familiar with uh, Glacial Lake Missoula, which is uh, over here in Northwestern Montana. But during the Ice Age, uh, as recently as 18,000 years ago, we had two other sources for Ice Age floods. The Ice Age ended about uh, 10, 12,000 years ago. And it started as, as early as two and a half million years ago. And most of the best evidence for these floods is from these last floods very, very at the very end of the ice age. <clears throat> the older flood deposits and the older uh, flood features, a lot of them were buried or uh, eroded away, destroyed by the ice age floods. So Lake Bonneville down here in Utah occurred once at about 18,000 years ago, and it came, came from this huge lake that uh, today, the, uh, the uh, Lake Bonneville, or uh, this Great Salt Lake near Salt Lake City is, is a remnant of Lake Bonneville. Lake Bonneville was you know, many times bigger than the Great Salt Lake. And it went up to, uh, up to the mountain passes around Salt Lake area. And when the lake overfilled, it had nowhere else place to go. It was an interior basin and all the water uh, for that basin drained into uh, to the interior of the lake. It had no escape route until the lake got so big 
that it actually overtopped a mountain pass up here called Red Mountain Pass. And that's Santa water through, going through uh, a channel up here. And it, it, it drained the lake about 200 feet in elevation until it hit the bedrock underneath. And then it was cut off from any more flow. But that 200 feet of lake water was, uh, was a huge vol volume of water. And for at least a week and maybe a couple weeks, uh, water drained out of Lake Bonneville and it went down into the Snake River and then on into back into the Columbia Basin, Columbia River down here and then eventually out to the ocean. We don't see any evidence for Lake Bonneville, um, uh, solid evidence for Lake Bonneville. We don't see deposits of Lake Bonneville once we uh, leave uh, Idaho, the Idaho-Oregon border down here has some uh, flood deposits. Lewiston, there's some flood deposits there associated with Lake Bonneville flood, but we don't see the evidence for Lake Bonneville further downstream. And the reason for that is it's probably buried in the younger floods from Lake Missoula, or it was removed, eroded by the Lake Missoula floods that came later. There is one other source for, for uh, Ice Age floods, and that's uh, this other lake called Glacial Lake Columbia which is up here in the north of the channel Scavland. When the Okanagan low came down from, the, from Canada, it blocked the Columbia River about where the Grand Coulee Dam is today. And it created this pretty good sized lake. It wasn't as big as Lake Missoula, but it was a pretty good sized. And there was no floods. There was only one flood from Lake Columbia. And that occurred at the very end of the ice age when the uh, Okanagan low started to head back up into Canada, uh, there was one flood that broke out through Lake, through the Okanagan Low, and that went down the Columbia River Valley, and then eventually out to the Pacific Ocean. And that only occurred once about 14,000 years ago, which was after the last flood from Glacial Lake Missoula. So all the floods from Glacial Lake Missoula occurred in between the time of the Lake Bonneville flood and the Lake Columbia flood. There were older floods from Lake, Lake Zula, but I'm not gonna be talking about those today. They're from previous ice ages. And I'll be focusing on the, uh, the most recent ice age that, that occurred between about 15 or 14,000 years ago and about 20,000 years ago. So here's a, a map that was produced by the Ice Age Floods Institute uh, in, in cooperation with Eastern Washington University produced this map. Gene Kiever, my, one of my, my co-author, was instrumental in getting this map out. And uh, it shows uh, Glacial Lake Missoula up here. It shows you where the ice, ice was coming down from Canada, the ice lobes being uh, the Puget Lobe coming down, filling the Puget Sound area with several thousand feet of ice you know, Seattle, Seattle was probably under 3,000 feet of uh, glacial ice from the, the Puget Lobe. Then we have this other lobe, the Okanagan Lobe, coming down, blocking the Columbia River and creating glacial Lake Missoula. It backed up behind the uh, Okanagan Lobe. And then this third lobe of ice, which is most important for Lake Missoula, and that was the Purcell Trench Lobe came down uh, from, from British Columbia into Northern Idaho, it blocked the Clark Fork River and created this uh, big lake, much bigger lake, 520 cubic miles of water uh, associated with this lake, up to 2000 feet deep. And uh, what happened periodically is uh, during the ice age, these ice lobes were in place, they stayed in place while the Missoula floods just kept, kept dumping water one, one time after another uh, separated by a few dozen years in between these uh, mega floods, ice age floods from Glacial Lake Missoula. And keep in mind that uh, during the ice age, a lot of the water, ocean water got transferred onto the continent as snow and ice. And uh, with all that transfer of water from the ocean to the continent, sea levels were, were lowered by three to 400 feet lower than they are today. And that would have pushed the coastline about 50 miles further west than where we see it today. 
So this is the Ice Age coastline here. This is the modern coastline. You can see things have changed drastically since the Ice Age. Here's a more simplified map showing you the elements for the Ice Age floods, the Missoula floods, and that being the uh, the, Oken, the uh, glacial lake Missoula, the, which which dammed up behind uh, the Purcell Trench Lobe, which is here. And then uh, what happened is every few dozen years between about uh, 14 or between 15,000 years ago, and maybe 18,000 years ago, every few dozen years, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, that ice dam would fail and all that water from Lake Missoula would drain out across the Idaho Panhandle. It went downstream Water doesn't flow uphill, it flows downhill. And that was in the direction of towards Spokane, which is over in this area here. Spokane was underneath Glacial Lake Columbia. And during, uh, during almost all the Missoula floods, the Lake, Lake Columbia pretty much uh, stayed in place. And, uh, and the water from Lake Missoula ran into and then ran over the top of Glacial Lake Columbia. And it didn't take much more water from uh, from Glacial Lake Missoula to overfill Lake Columbia and that sent flood water, a lot of the flood waters down across what we call the Channel Scabland. Okay, Channel Scabland is up to 100 miles wide and uh, it covers a good sizable part of uh, Eastern Washington. The last flood from Lake Missoula was probably around 15,000 years ago and the earliest flood, which I mentioned earlier, uh, go back to perhaps as early as one to two million years ago, back to the beginning of the ice age, which is about two and a half million years ago. And there were a lot of floods, maybe many hundreds, maybe even a thousand floods or more. If the same process occurred in the earlier ice age as, as what happened in the last ice age, there could have been a thousand floods or more altogether during the ice age. They left behind uh, these very, uh, some very characteristic flood features. Uh, they were, a lot of them were erosional, the wearing away of the land and other flood features are depositional. In other words, they were, these are places where they left behind deposits of uh, ice raft erratics or, or these rhythmites, which represent uh, slack water flood dep deposition going on. And uh, I'm not gonna go through every one of these, but. I will be talking about a lot of these flood features and pointing out uh, them and showing you on uh, pictures and photographs, aerial photographs that I'll be uh, covering during the rest of the presentation. <clears throat> okay, so if you're, familiar, if you're familiar with the Ice Age floods, you're familiar with this individual. This was the, uh, the man who, had the, who was the brainchild for these ice age floods and the theory behind them. And uh, he, uh, he, he came to the Pacific Northwest working uh, as a geologist, as a professor at University of Washington in the early 1920s, late teens and early 20s. And he was uh, intrigued by some unusual landforms he saw in Eastern Washington. So in his free time, he'd leave Seattle and come over to the east side of the mountains, east side of the Cascades, and it started doing some field work, investigating, uh, trying to figure out what caused these unusual features he was, he was finding. And then in 1923, uh, he finally published a paper to summarizing the results that he had gathered so far. And all, the only, he, could, could, he could only come up with one explanation uh, for his outrageous hypothesis, which was that the only genetic interpretation yet proposed, which is inherently harmonious and which fits all the known facts, is that of a great flood of water. So here he was, he was proposing something very outrageous. At the time, other geologists all thought the earth changed very slowly over a very long period of time, similar to you know, how the Grand Canyon formed. It, it formed very slowly over millions of years. And here, J, J. Harlan Bretz was proposing something akin to Noah's flood. And that didn't sit very well with, with the, the geologist. 
at the time because they were trying to distance themselves from the biblical explanation of geology. So here Bretz was, uh, he was considered a heretic, heretic to geology because he was sending us back to the dark ages with his outrageous hypothesis of a, of a Spokane flood, which is the name he gave it. He couldn't give it a, he didn't know where the source of the water was. Um, he just knew that it came from the direction of Spokane. So he called it the Spokane flood. And he thought it was just one flood. But years later, people started, uh, the number of floods increased, increased over time to where now we're over uh, almost 100 floods for the last glacial uh, cycle alone. <clears throat> this is a satellite photo taken uh, in 1972 from space. And if, if images like this had been available during Brett's time, uh, other, other geologists might have come around to his way of thinking much sooner. But as early as 1923, he had already figured it out. He had already mapped out the locations of all the channels for the Ice Age floods. It's basically these dark lines running through the scab land where the Ice Age floods eroded away all the topsoil, which is this lighter colored material. This is loose loss, well, windblown soil that covered the basalt before the Ice Age floods completely covered uh, Eastern Washington and hundreds of feet, up to hundreds of feet of this polluted soil. And when the floods came through, they, they eroded through the, that, that soil cover and eroded down into the basalt bedrock, which, which is a dark <clears throat> volcanic rock underneath. So Brett's had already figured out that the, what he was seeing on the ground are these channels that were eroded out by these uh, ice age, by the ice age, by the Spokane flood as he defined it. And here's a, uh, a closer up view looking at the, the ice dam for Glacial Lake Missoula. And that being uh, the area down here. Uh, here's the Idaho Montana border, which is about where the ice slope uh, uh, moved to before it uh, black, while it backed up the Clark Fork River, creating Glacial Lake Missoula behind it. The, uh, the Purcell Trench Low coming down from, from British Columbia moved down the, the, the Purcell Trench into the Sandpoint area. And one lobe of ice actually moved up the Clark Fork River and caused this dam here that created Lake Missoula. And another lobe of ice came down where Lake Ponderay is today. And it, it got down about as far as the upper Rathburn Prairie before it, before it ended. Uh, as far as that's as far as far as it got, so you can see there's a pretty good sized ice dam, up to 30 miles long, that was responsible for the the backup of glacial Lake Missoula, but apparently uh, it, during every few dozen years, the pressure, the water filling up behind the ice dam, a deepening lake 2,000 feet deep up against the pushing against the the lower end of the ice dam. The upper end of the ice dam caused to probably destabilize the ice dam, causing it to break apart. And all that water was allowed to drain very suddenly, in just a matter of a few days. They believe Lake Missoula might have completely drained, sending its, sending its uh, water down through the Spokane area into a glacial like Columbia, which was already there during, during most of the floods, and then out across the Channel Scabland. So here's a, 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 an illustrative photo showing you what the ice dam might have looked like uh, during one of these, just prior to one of these ice age floods. This, this image is looking to the west. Uh, Dave Bennett is a, uh, uh, a pilot who has his own plane and he flies around and gets some great pictures. He took this picture uh, and then he gave it to some, uh, a graphic artist uh, who is an expert in Photoshop apparently, and he, the, the artist, uh, drew, drew in where the ice dam was, as well as uh, the ice and icebergs floating around within Lake Glacial Lake Missoula. So this is the start of Glacial Lake Missoula, uh, 2,000 feet deep up against this ice dam. So what's the evidence for Glacial Lake Missoula? You know, it's not there. 
today, and it hasn't been there since the last uh, Missoula floods about 15,000 years ago. But the, the best evidence, some of the best evidence are these strand lines. Uh, this is a mount, this is Mount Jumbo near uh, the, the city of Missoula, Montana. And you can see uh, etched into the hill, hillsides are these very parallel lines. These are ancient lake levels of Lake Missoula that were preserved as the lake was filling and got uh, up to the very maximum lake level up here. You can see the strand lines, strand lines stop. That's about 4,200 feet elevation. But below that, there are these uh, multiple strand lines that, that record the, the past levels of glacial Lake Missoula. But during the, uh, during the maximum level of Lake Missoula, it filled up to this 4,200 foot level that I show you here, based on the fact that there are no strand lines above that elevation, which is a good indication that that, that was the maximum depth for Lake Missoula. So another good piece of evidence for uh, rapid, very rapid, uh, deep floodwaters draining out of Lake Missoula is here at Camas Prairie. During the uh, biggest floods uh, or during the maximum levels of glacial Lake Missoula, uh, Lake, Missoula the Lake Missoula floodwaters filled this basin up to near the tops of these peaks you can see on either side. And when that ice dam failed, all that water raced raced out very quickly. And as it did so, it, it, it would speed up as it flowed through this narrower constriction. That's a Venturi effect. When you force a fluid uh, through a narrower opening, you'll, the water, the speed of the water will, will, will quicken. So you can see up here, there's actually scabland like features that were that formed from erosion within that, uh, that, that uh, pass, that mountain pass. But then as the floodwaters expanded into the basin where these ripples are, it slowed down and that allowed uh, ripples to form. But didn't it slow down low enough to wipe out the ripples? It, it was still moving pretty fast to create these giant current ripples that you can see on the, on the valley floor here. And here's a nice, uh, here's a homestead over here uh, for scale. You see these ripples are, you know, hundreds of feet uh, apart and, you know, many, uh, maybe 10, 10 feet or more tall. And when you're standing in between these ripples or even on the top of them, you really can't see the next one or understand or appreciate, you know, what they really are from a, from a ground level. You really have to get up in the air to really see, get a good uh, perspective on the, uh, these ripples. And we see these similar ripples all the way down through the scab land. And then uh, they, they really don't see them down in the gorge, but basically in the channel scab land and some of the coolies, uh, many of the coolies will see these giant current ripples. Okay, um, during the Ice Age floods, the uh, Eddy Narrows was um, an area that was uh, upstream of the of the ice dam. So it was behind, it was in glacial Lake Missoula floodwaters that backed up behind the ice dam that was further downstream. This is the Clark Fork River. And all the floodwaters from glacial Lake, glacial Lake Missoula had to go through this one single opening. The, the Missoula floodwaters spread out and in some places they divided <clears throat> to occupy different valleys. So there were different other places where, where the floods went through multiple channels to, to, to drain. But here at Eddy Narrows, this was a single opening where all the floodwaters had to drain through. And the floodwaters went up to near the tops of these hills on either side, uh, 2,000 feet deep uh, lake waters that were backed up behind the ice dam. And uh, another geologist by the name Joseph T. Pardee uh, studied Glacial Lake Missoula, and he's, he's the guy that actually finally convinced Brett's that uh, Glacial Lake Missoula was the source for these Ice Age floods. But early on, in, uh, as early as uh, 1910, um, no, that was 1940, I'm sorry, 1942, he published a paper 
and he calculated the volume, the rate and volume of flood water that was going through uh, this, this single opening. And he estimated the speed of the water was somewhere around 10 to 20 uh, million cubic meters per second. And, uh, and the waters, all the water, he knew, he knew the volume of the water behind uh, the, the ice dam and he was able to calculate that all the water drained out once the ice dam had failed all the way to, all the water was able to drain out in a matter of just two or three days. Which explains why the, the, the destruction and the catastrophic nature of the floods downstream because it, it drained so rapidly. <clears throat> Here's the lower end of the ice dam for Glacial Lake Missoula and the lower end got down to about as far as where, where Lake Ponderé is today. It didn't exist, Lake Ponderé didn't exist during the ice age because it was obviously filled with, with thousands of feet of glacial ice. And it got, it extended down here, uh, down to about Rathrum Prairie and the upper end of Rathrum Prairie at Farragut State Park. And this is about as far as it got, it was down here. So beyond that, uh, to the area south of here was the outburst uh, point for these Missoula floods. <clears throat> Here's a kind of a, a shaded relief map showing you the uh, ice. This is the extent of the ice slope down onto the Rathdrum Prairie. And uh, beyond that, when the, when the ice dam broke apart, floodwaters from Lake Missoula came in. They were going pretty fast through here and there wasn't much deposition going on until it got out into the Rathdrum Prairie. It spread out and it, it deposited a huge flood bar or an outburst plain out onto the Rathdrum Prairie, hundreds of feet thick, the very coarse flood, flood deposits out on that Rathdrum Prairie. And it, it actually raised the level of, of the prairie uh, during the Ice Age floods. Uh, all these floods, one after another coming out, raised the level of the Rathdrum Prairie a couple, two or 300 feet elevation. And it, it blocked the tributaries, drainages coming in from the side. So these lakes you can see around the margins of the Rathdrum Prairie are all the result of the filling of the Rathdrum Prairie with these flood deposits and blocking off or damming the, the tributary streams that were coming in from the sides. All right, so uh, beyond uh, Rathdrum Prairie, the floods came into the Spokane area, which is up here. And uh, during, most of the Ice Age floods, most of the Missoula floods, there was already a, a pre-existing lake that sat in here called Glacial Lake Columbia. It's not there today. This is a recent satellite photo. So the lake doesn't, isn't shown obviously here, but it formed, Lake Columbia formed when the ice dam blocked the uh, Columbia River uh, at Grand Coulee Dam or about, right about here and created a huge lake. It extended almost all the way up uh, into the Rathburn Prairie. And so the floods coming in from the, from the east via Rathburn Prairie overfilled Lake Columbia and then they started to spill out across what we call the channel scab land. Okay, so here's those dark lines of where the basalt was exposed uh, by floods that stripped away the topsoil. You see there's lots of good agriculture going on in these islands of Palouse soil that weren't stripped away by the floods in between. But in the coolies themselves, in the Scabland channels themselves, there's very little agriculture going on because pretty much all the soil, topsoil is stripped away and nothing will grow there except cheatgrass. And here's an example of uh, the heads of one of these coolies up near Sprague Lake. This is the head of the Chini Palouse Scabland track and you can see where the floods uh, eroded out these these basins and left behind buttes, erosional remnants of the basalt flows that they eroded into. Before the Ice Age floods, this was all one continuous flow of basalt lava that covered this entire area to the same level. Um, but today, but since the Ice Age floods, you can see it, it carved out these uh, these scour holes, basins, and left behind the remnants. The more uh, resistant basalt that are in between. 
So this is typical of what uh, the scab land looks like. Further downstream in the Cheney Palouse tract, uh, the lower end uh, above or near uh, Palouse Falls, you can see remnants of these of the Palouse Hills that once covered the basalt. And today they're they were they're streamlined, uh, bullet-shaped islands, and they're streamlined because of the floods coming through uh, eroded channels through these these uh, remnants of the Palouse Hills uh, down into the basalt bedrock. And then left behind these uh, bullet shaped in their streamlined, steeper uh, the upper end of the, uh, the, the islands and gentler at the lower end. And they're all pointing in the same direction as the floods, while they're all pointing upstream, which would have been behind uh, the, the view of this, this image. Okay, drive back to Dry Falls, which is over on the opposite side of the scab land, you know, maybe. Uh, it's almost 100 miles away to the west. Dry Falls is another place where the same floods, uh, or some of the same floods may have been flowing at the same time. But coming down the Grand Coulee, they, uh, they dropped over into Dry Falls. Dry Falls is a 400 foot tall uh, recessional cataract, just basically a dry waterfall where the floods uh, dropped over a cliff, they undercut the, the lower end of the cliff and allowed the, the cataract to recede upstream as the floods were coming through. Everything in this image would have been hundred, hundreds of feet of flood water, all eroding, going maybe 60, 70 miles an hour. And you can see these beautiful grooves are carved out by the floods uh, running over the top of this basalt flow. There's a couple of uh, nice uh, potholes that were probably created as there were some eddying going on within the flood current. And also I wanna point out this blade of basalt. Okay, this is called Umatilla Rock, but it's a single narrow, gets very narrow uh, blade of basalt that separates one cataract uh, alcove from another horseshoe shaped uh, cataract alcove over here. And I'll keep this in mind because you're gonna see this, uh, this, hap this is a recurring theme of features left behind by the Ice Age floods is a lot of times they erode these dual cataract canyons and leave behind a blade of basalt down the middle. And there's really no other place you can see this going on. It doesn't happen today at this scale in modern uh, environments that, that are existing today anywhere on Earth. The only other place you see features all like, like this are on the planet Mars. And they formed also in basalt when uh, some past floods from billions of years ago occurred on Mars at one time in the distant past. Well, here's a lower end of Palouse River uh, showing you uh, the, the Palouse River Canyon here. Dry, or Palouse Falls is just off the video, off the, the picture down here in the lower left. So this is the Palouse River coming down. You can see it's very straight and confined to a very narrow channel. And there's these other channels. There are these other canyons. Here's one there, and there's one going across here and a bunch of others. Uh, there's a crisscrossing network of channels, flood channels, that were scoured out by Ice Age floods that took advantage of cracks in the ground, cracks in the basalt. And uh, they eroded out weak, these weaker areas that were cracked were preferentially eroded out plucked out by these ice age floods. So you can see the remnants of these, these, uh, these old fractures or tectonic fractures, cracks that formed uh, when the basalt flows were uh, coming out millions of years ago. And here's another example, dry, there's a Devil's Canyon, uh, not too far away, a few miles, uh, maybe a couple tens of miles to the west of Palouse Falls is this Devil's Canyon. And it's a single, uh, it's a very straight linear canyon. And again, this, this canyon here is exactly parallel to the Palouse River, if you look at it on a map. And it's these tectonic fractures that formed uh, millions of years ago uh, due to tectonic stresses in the crust. And they were probably trying to pull the, the crust apart 
And as they did so, they left behind these openings, these cracks in the ground. And uh, they had just happened to be parallel, which is common in tectonic environments to have parallel features like this. But you can see during the Ice Age floods, uh, the, the floods took advantage of Devil's Canyon and eroded out this beautiful canyon. There's no water, not a drop of water to be found in Devil's Canyon today, or nor, nor has there been any water flowing through this since uh, the last Missoula floods about uh, 15,000 years ago. All right, so now we're gonna move over to uh, an area to the west and south of the Grand Coulee. Grand Coulee came in to the Quincy Basin from the north coming down in this direction. And <clears throat> when the, all that water coming through Grand Coulee uh, entered, the, entered the Quincy Basin, it slowed down and caused a lot of deposition of soil, which actually uh, promotes uh, crop growth today in the Quincy Basin. But that water came in so quickly, so fast that it, but it, it very rapidly filled the Quincy Basin with flood water and it actually went up and over these divides off to the west side of the Quincy Basin. Before the Ice Age floods, these, this was a high ridge of uh, soil and basalt that divided the Columbia River from the Quincy Basin. With the floods coming in to the Quincy Basin, rapidly filled that, overfilled this basin over that ridge and then started draining into the Columbia River down below. There's an 800 foot drop between the ridge up here and the river. There was, a, that's a, an amazing amount of hydraulic head, amazing amount of drop for these ice age floods over a very short distance, which caused some intense, very intense erosion along these uh, coolies, these dual cataract canyons on the west side of the Quincy Basin. But uh, at the same time, the floods were also moving down into the Drumheller channels and they eroded out an eight mile wide channel complex of the Drumheller channels. And then they continued on down into another channel complex down here in the, called the Othello channels. And these are, the reason the floods went through here and not over the Frenchman Hills is because everything in white was above the level of the flood. So the floods couldn't get over the Frenchman Hills, they couldn't get over the Saddle Mountains. So they found a lower outlet for the floodwaters at the, at the east ends of these hills that are uh, uh, the border of the Pasco Basin and Othello Basin. But I'm gonna start up here in the Potholes Coulee and then we'll work our way down. And I'll show you these flood features from, uh, from uh, closer up uh, and from the air. Okay, here's Potholes Coulee. It's also referred to as ancient lakes, but the floods coming uh, over the, the Potholes Coulee completely filled everything you could see here in the foreground. The only thing that was sticking out above the floodwaters in this image would have been these, these hills uh, that are covered with uh, soil that wasn't stripped away by the floods. And these hills over here were above the level of the floods. But everything else here would have been under hundreds of feet of flood water. And when the floods came through, they, they started to erode, to erode cataracts into the area where they dropped into the Columbia River, which is down here. And with each flood that came through, these cataract, these uh, horseshoe shaped canyons would erode their way headward upstream into the flow of the water and eventually creating these uh, cataracts, these horseshoe shaped canyons at the upper end. Now here's another example of uh, one of these cataract canyons. This is a companion of Pothole Coulee that we just looked at at the south end of the Quincy Basin. This is Frenchman Coulee. And you can see again, there's two, two cataract canyons. There's the main one here, and then there's another one called uh, Dusty, or uh, I can't remember the name, there's a, there, but there's a second cataract over here and it's separated by a blade of basalt, okay? Same thing as we saw up at Dry Falls, there was that blade of basalt, the Umatilla rock that extended down from Dry Falls. And remember here too at uh, Potholes Coulee that we just looked at, 
there's another blade of basalt there that separates two cataract canyons. So these, these dual cataract canyons are a, a recurring theme for these ice age floods. And here's the Drumheller channels at the southeast end of Quincy Basin. And this area was being flooded at the same time the Quincy Basin, um, Potholes Coulee, and Frenchman Coulees were being eroded at the west end of the Quincy Basin. All those, all these channels, these spillways were operating at the same time. So it's just a phenomenal amount of flood water moving through here at, at once. And the Othello channels, this is that, uh, that, that spillway that, that, that uh, the floods eroded at the east end of the Saddle Mountains. Okay, these are the Saddle Mountains. And here you can see there's crops growing up on the top of the Saddle Mountains here because this area was above the level of the floods. So the floods were unable to erode away all the topsoil. But obviously in here, everything was eroded away down into the basalt bedrock. And uh, then you had you have these jeep channels and grooves, nice, these some nice grooves eroded into the basalt bedrock through the Othello channels. Okay, so um, we're going to switch gears now and uh, move down into the Lake Lewis area. Okay, and Lake Lewis is a lake that doesn't exist anymore. It was a very temporary lake that formed when all that flood water from Lake Missoula spread out for 100 miles across the Scabland and it all converged onto this one little opening, the little gap. That's only about two miles wide. So you can imagine what happened when all that water, two, twice as much water converged on Wallula Gap as could go through at once. So that created backwater in Lake Missoula that, that back flooded up the Yakima River as far as Yakima and it reversed the flow of the Walla Walla River up into the Walla Walla Basin. And it reversed the flow of the Snake River all the way up to Lewiston, Idaho, which is up here. And that lake only existed for as long as it took the, for the flood water to drain through the gap. And that was somewhere around two or three weeks for all that water from Lake, Lake Lewis to, to drain through the little gap. So now we're gonna be, I'm gonna focus on some of the features that we're uh, gonna see in uh, Lake Lewis. Okay, here's a more closer up view. You can see everything in blue was underwater during uh, the largest Missoula flood, everything in brown was above the level of the floods. And the reason we know, we know that high water mark based on distribution and the height of what we call ice rafted erratics. Okay, these are rocks, something other than basalt, which is the only rock native to this area. And when we see other rocks, especially light colored rocks uh, on hillsides around the basin, we know they had to have come uh, rafted in on icebergs. The ice, the glacial ice never got down this far south. So the only, the only logical explanation is that they were rafted in on icebergs that were floating uh, at the top of like of uh, the, the Missoula floods coming in. And here's a little gap, that narrow opening um, where all the floodwaters were forced to go through. Here it is again, the Willowla Gap. Uh, Two Sisters is a local landmark within uh, Willowla Gap. This is the Columbia River. All the, all the Columbia River actually has been flowing through here for many millions of years. Uh, long before the Ice Age floods, the Columbia River had already established a channel through here. And uh, so the floods always took the path of least resistance. And that, and that was always taking advantage of whatever river or streams uh, already existed. Other times they had they created their own streams and channels uh, that, that hadn't pre previously been created during these ice age floods. And you can see the uh, there's obviously erosion going on along the margins of the uh, the, the, the gap. You can see the, the all the soil is stripped off the walls of the coulee. But also notice the, the stripping of the soil goes all the way up uh, to the, almost to the very top of a little gap way up here. These, 
these uh, hills in the foreground were all were all underwater during the largest ice age floods. So the backwater from uh, Lake uh, Lake Lewis, uh, the dammed up behind the hydraulically dammed below the gap, um, created Lake Lake Lewis, which is Here's the high water mark for Lake Lewis was about 1,250 feet elevation. Based on the elevations, the maximum elevations of these ice wrapped erratics that we see distributed across the, the, the Pasco Basin in particular. And they, they came in floating on icebergs. The floods coming in from the, off the Scavland uh, tended to push uh, these icebergs off to the margins of the basin which is where we see most of the erratics, especially in places like Rattlesnake Mountain. I've, I mapped on uh, Rattlesnake Mountain several years ago for erratics, and I spent a couple of years mapping in a 25 square mile area up there. And I, I identified over 2,000. I mapped and identified over 2,000 ice wrapped erratics that were bigger than a suitcase, let's say. So there, there are a lot of them there. More, I've seen more ice rafted erratics on Rattlesnake Mountain than anywhere else. And that laid along the margins of the Pasco Basin. And I'm sure there are lots of icebergs uh, from multiple floods that ended up getting grounded up there. And obviously after the iceberg is grounded, the ice will melt and it'll leave behind its payload of uh, erratic debris that was uh, uh, embedded inside the iceberg. Most 75% of the iceberg or the uh, erratics I mapped were, were granitic, granitic rocks, uh, granite or granodiorite. And they're, they're these characteristic white color. Uh, and they're usually, they're usually angular, all sometimes they are rounded too, but they are huge boulders, the oversized boulders for the soil is present naturally in the area. This particular boulder is, uh, 800 feet above the Columbia River and we'll look at the gap here. This is one of the biggest we've seen in the Pasco Basin. Uh, monster, this is a monster erratic in the Badger Coulee. And here's, here's on Rattlesnake Mountain, here's a piece of argillite. And argillite is a uh, rock that we can trace back to Northern Idaho, to the Belt Supergroup. Uh, all along the pathway, in the ice dam for Glacier Lake Missoula, you'll see these rocks. And they're, they're ancient uh, uh, river and lake deposits uh, that have since been uh, deeply buried, heavily metamorphosed. In other words, they've been, uh, they've been under, they've lain under thousands and thousands of feet of, of ice, or not ice, of the crust, buried under crust under very high temperatures and pressures. And then uh, since then, they've been exhumed and uh, now exposed at the surface in Northern Idaho. But you can still see the layering uh, of, of these uh, ancient river and lake deposits within these, these, uh, these rocks of argillite. So this particular rock started, probably started out as a shale, uh, uh, then metamorphosed, metamor metamorphosed into a slate, and then under further metamorphism, compaction and heat, it, it was transitioned into what we call an argillite. It was a very, very hard rock. If you hit it with a rock hammer, it rings. It's so hard and dense. And there's no way to break it. It won't break along bedding planes like uh, like uh, slit, slate and shale do, does, but it's, it's, it's a remnant or a, a relative of shale and slate. So, um, after the floods water, flood waters moved through Wallula Gap, they continue down, down, and following the Columbia River, all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. But along the way, the floods, uh, they, were, they were so deep, it, they were actually able to overfill the Columbia Valley and spill over into, into side valleys on either side. And Philippi Canyon here is one good example of that. Uh, here's I-84, Interstate 84, that runs along the Oregon uh, side of the Columbia River. And uh, as you drive by on 84, you can you can see 
the can uh, canyon. You can see Philippi Canyon. You can, but all you can really see is this part here, and it's really nothing uh, really that spectacular from the highway. But when you get up in the air, then you can really see how the floods coming down from the from the east came into the Philippi Canyon, and they they uh, they found an opening, a, a lower valley on the south side of the, the gorge and filled the valley with water and then overfilled the valley and then spilled over into scab land, as you can see here in the distance. And that, that drained into the John Day River basin. Here you can see the John Day River up here. So this is a spillover channel for the Ice Age floods that came into Philippi Canyon up and over the uh, the the the, uh, the saddle the, the the head of the canyon and then uh, down into the John Day River and then a few miles downstream of there they rejoined the Columbia River and further downstream near uh, near Celilo, uh that would be uh, just uh, east of the Dells uh, again along Highway. The interstate I-84, you can see, is down here. And when you're out driving along the interstate, you can see, all you can see is a wall of basalt. All you see is this up here. But when you get up in the air, then you can really see how the floods had their way with this uh, bench of basalt bedrock that stuck out into the Columbia Valley. And the floods actually went all the way up to this point here. You can here you can see the, the, uh, the scarp, an escarpment that was created as the floods eroded these so, uh, soil deposits that overlied the basalt up here in this, this area. So everything, everything from here on down was under hundreds of feet of flood water. And when the floods came through, they stripped away all the soil off this basalt bench and eroded into, again, these are tectonic fractures, very uh, linear uh, weaknesses that, that were taken advantage of by the Ice Age floods. Uh, coming through this area. And they stripped away multiple basalt flows. There's a, here's one basalt flow up here that once extended all the way across, but the floods eroded away the younger or the older flows below that. And then here's another flow and another flow. So there are multiple flows. You get these rock benches forming, uh, which are the remnants of these ancient lava flows that uh, once came down into, through the Columbia Gorge. Okay, so um, finishing up, coming up to uh, the, the uh, end, of, end of my presentation, and I want to uh, finish with uh, talking about some unusual erratics. Uh, not at least one of them is very unusual. The other ones, uh, the Bellevue erratic, is is a piece of argillite rock that ended up uh, rafting in on the ice age floods that came in. That uh, uh, from the Columbia Gorge, floods came in, they filled the Portland Basin, overfilled it, spilled over through some channel ways in uh, Oregon City and, uh, and Lake Oswego. And then they, they spread out, back flooded south, all the way down into Eugene, to the, to the Eugene, Oregon area, created what we call a Lake Allison. Okay, so this is, this is water that back flooded from the Columbia River. Uh, down into the Lake Allison, Willamette Valley area. And uh, the two erratics, there's one that's the Bellevue erratic and then the, uh, the Willamette meteorite is another erratic that I'll talk about after that. So I should say the, uh, the lake waters from Lake Allison went up to about an elevation of 400 feet elevation. So here's, uh, this is looking south towards the Bellevue erratic, which is taken from, this is from the air. This is, uh, this is from the, this is just above the, the surface of the drone. You see there's a, there's a state park, uh, rafted rock state park, I think it's called, uh, or Bellevue erratic. Uh, and it's a piece of argillite similar to what I pointed out at Rattlesnake Mountain earlier. We can trace this back to outcrops of the very similar looking rock 
that are uh, built or that were built and made uh, into a rock wall that you can see here. These are all bell rocks. They're very tabular shaped and they have, they preserve the, the ancient stratification that was uh, formed uh, as these rocks were deposited. Uh, one as, early, as long as one and a half billion years ago. Okay, that's that's billion with a B. And uh, so this is an outcropping of those belt rocks in the background where they got these boulders from. But glaciers actually, uh, the ice dam for Glacial Lake Missoula was was pushed up against these rocks. So a lot of these rocks got embedded into the ice uh, dam for Lake Missoula, carried in with the uh, with the ice age floods all the way down 600 miles away into the Willamette Valley of Oregon. Okay, so lastly, uh, here's the Willamette meteorite. This is uh, a, a meteorite that was found back in the uh, 1902 by these, uh, by some local landowners. And they, it did leave, uh, there's a depression uh, later on, people found a depression where a rock was taken from and it was moved all, a few times. It moved to a local landowner that tried to steal it from another landowner. And then eventually it ended, ended up in a museum in, uh, in uh, New York City uh, back in the early 1900s, where it still is today. You can still go and see it uh, in this museum. Uh, it's 15 and a half tons. Uh, six largest meteorite in the world and the largest meteorite found in the US so far. But the, the location of the meteorite is at 400 feet elevation based on the hole that it left uh, when they, after they removed it. There is no crater there. There is a hole you know, where the meteorite sat in the soil, but there is no crater, meteor crater it was left behind, but there is there are ice rafted erratics nearby that they uh, at the same elevation. So, and also uh, when the floods came in from the Portland Basin, from the Columbia River Gorge into the Portland Basin, they, a lot of the water went, continued on down the Columbia River to the Pacific, but a lot of the water did backflow up into the Willamette Valley, as I pointed out earlier. And then you had this side, side canyon coming in and where the floods came into these side canyons, so oftentimes you'll see eddy currents taking place. So there would have been an eddy coming in from this direction, eddy coming in from this direction, which would have pushed any icebergs up onto an area where the Willamette meteorite was found. So all these, all the information gathered so far seems to point that this was an ice rafted erratic, uh, rafted in on an iceberg during one of these Missoula floods. And if so, it probably is the most unusual erratic. And the way it would have gotten there originally is uh, it, you know, if, it, if it landed into the ice sheet, the Cordillera ice sheet up in British Columbia, all that ice was flowing south towards Northern Idaho and into eventually into the, the ice dam for Glacial Lake Missoula. So that's, that's how we've surmised that how it ended up getting here from after uh, maybe traveling from outer space. <clears throat> okay, so on um, this shameless commerce portion of my talk is uh, is in a few next few slides. I've I do have a YouTube channel where I've posted a lot of videos of Ice Age flood features taken mostly with a drone, and uh, I didn't I don't. I didn't present any videos today because they do slow down the Zoom feed and they don't really show up very well on a Zoom feed. So I, I stuck with still photographs in my presentation tonight. But if you really want to see a lot of these features uh, in motion from a drone, then I would recommend going to to these uh, to this Ice Ice Age Floods Floodscapes YouTube channel. I'm adding new new videos uh, on a regular basis. I'll be posting another one probably hopefully in the next month or so. And uh, if you subscribe to the channel, like up here, uh, you'll automatically receive notification when I when new uh, videos are posted. 
and I, as I, as Melanie mentioned, I did I did publish two books previously on the Ice Age floods. These are uh, field guides that are written for the layman to take with them when they go out into the field and to to actually see these features. Guide it guides people to see these features for themselves. And as also I mentioned earlier uh, with some people is I have a new book coming out. Uh, it's called Ice Age Floodscapes of the Pacific Northwest, a photographic exploration, which has taken uh, photographs I've taken mostly with the drone and fixed wing airplane of some of these features and, and, and providing uh, captions, descriptions, short, short captions and description, descriptions to describe the, uh, the images. And it will be a hard hardcover coffee table type book in full color. And right now, uh, I'm hoping for publication sometime during the, the next year in 2021. It's taking longer um, than expected. I'm dealing with publishers uh, uh, from India, with editors from India, who know, who've probably never been to the United States and don't know the first thing about Ice Age floods. So it's a learning experience for both of us and learning the Ice Age floods and me learning how to deal with a foreign publisher. But anyway, uh, hopefully that'll be coming soon. And it is with Springer Nature, which is a international publisher. It'll get wide, worldwide distribution. And it's the same publisher that produces uh, 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 Scientific American uh, magazine and as well as the journal, the Nature Journals. And you can pre-order at Amazon at any time. Okay, with that, I will. I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And uh, take any questions if we have any. So far, there are no questions in the chat. So okay. I think we have. Uh, it's okay. We don't have uh, tons and tons of people. So if you have a question for Bruce. You can go ahead and turn on your camera and unmute and uh, ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, hello, yes. Yeah, uh, I was, hear you. Was, thank you. Uh, was Lake Bonneville blocked by ice? And if so, where'd that ice come from? Good question. I've, I didn't go into the details, but no, it wasn't. The uh, lake, lake both Lake Columbia and Lake Missoula were ice dammed, but Lake Bonneville wasn't ice dammed. It was blocked by, uh, well, it was an interior drainage, so there was no way for the water to escape. Uh, there was no rivers le leaving the basin that it was in. So it actually found a low pass, Red Rock Pass, and, and the lake waters, when they got so deep, they, uh, they rose over that that debris dam at the Red Rock Pass and started to cut a channel into that debris that was blocking the pass. And it carved, it carved a channel that was 200 feet deep through the debris before it, it stopped. So there was, that's how the 200 foot level of the lake was breached, it was by a debris dam at the at Red Rock Pass. And the water followed the Snake River yeah, it, uh, it followed a tributary of the snake first down into uh, Idaho Falls. Or no, not Idaho Falls. Uh, Twin Falls? Can't the name. What's that? It's Pocatello. Pocatello, yeah. It, it followed a tributary down to Pocatello, and then it joined in with the, the Snake River from there. Thank you. Hey, in the yeah, chat, a question from Don Chadbourne. When the Okanagan lobe receded, was there more than one flood from Lake Columbia? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, we don't have, we have good evidence for what just one flood. It doesn't mean there isn't, we won't find other evidence for other floods. But it makes sense because uh, once the ice dam, well, the Okanagan lobe didn't fail until the end of the ice age. So when it failed that one time, uh, the ice just kept retreating its way, finding its way north. It, it wouldn't have reestablished another ice dam to create another lake. So the 
the evidence suggests that it was one flood and that's supported by the timing of uh, that flood too, which is about 14,000 years ago at the very end of the ice age. Uh, Bruce? Yes. Another one. Um, yeah. Would it be incorrect to say that flood waters in present day Wenatchee, East Wenatchee, would, were from the Missoula floods? Would that be wrong? Was it all Okanagan? I mean, Lake, Lake, Lake Okanagan? Uh, no, it wasn't. That's another good question. Uh, you, you've obviously been doing some research because you know the uh, a lot of the uh, fine, finer details of these floods, but your question is uh, did there was a flood. There are actually two floods that came through Wenatchee. Uh, there was a, a very big flood that occurred about 18,000 years ago before the Okanagan Lope had advanced down uh, onto the Waterville Plateau. So there was a big, big flood that came down through Wenatchee before the Okanagan Lope. But there was another, that last flood came through Wenatchee with the breakup of the Okanagan Lope at the very end of the Ice Age. So there were there is evidence for two floods in Wenatchee area. One one was very early, one was very late. Where was the first one originating? It came from probably came from Lake Missoula, a very big Missoula flood. Oh. Yeah. Yep. And it went up really high. We see erratics uh, going way up on the hills around Wenatchee. Uh, Wenatchee. Uh, ice rafted erratics and the only way they could have gotten there is from a very big flood and the only other place the only place we've seen really big floods in the northwest like that is Lake Missoula. Uh, but good question. If nobody else is waiting uh, I don't want to dominate. What was the southernmost point of the Puget Sound globe? Olympia? Uh, yeah it went down to about as far as Olympia. Where the, where the sound water itself is today. Yeah, yeah, I think it may have gone, it may have gone a little bit further beyond that, but it's kind of in that general area. Yep, and there is a, there's a glacier, there's a moraines down there where they can actually see where the, the terminus for the, the Puget Lobe was. So Bruce, uh, Gary Ford here with, Hi, a, Gary. with a question. Uh, this is almost philosophical, but uh, you know there there can't be many areas out there that you haven't looked at in all of the years you've been studying the floods. And I was mm -hmm. curious uh, of all of the things you've looked at and and thought about uh, associated with the floods. What's the most amazing or most remarkable? thing that you've seen or learned? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. Well, you know, Philippi Canyon is so, is so special. It's so unique. I think Philippi Canyon is one. Uh, hmm. One of my top, where is I'd rate in the top, Philippi Canyons along the Columbia Gorge. Um, it's uh, between Arling between Arlington and Biggs, along the Columbia Gorge, and the Eastern Columbia Gorge, and it's a place where the flood. I, I showed a slide of it, uh, where the floods went up, had to rise up hundreds of feet. I don't know, maybe floods had to go up 600 feet before they could spill over. And then they went. They kept going up beyond that to spill over into the John Day River Valley. So that that that's a pretty special place. And plus, uh, you really it's really it's all very private. It's private land all through there, and it's really hard to investigate all because of Oregon. that. It's on the Oregon side. It's on the Oregon side. Yep. Yep. But that's the beauty of a drone is you can uh, you can get away. I mean. You're limited without a drone. You're limited on where you can go, and there's a lot of private or restricted land out there. Um, and with a drone, you can, you know, you can get around that. Hey, a okay, question in the chat from uh, Dick Jensen at Wenatchee. Okay, there are hundreds of feet of sand accumulation. How long did a lake sit there to create 
this structure. Where was that again? At Wenatchee. In Lake what? In Wenatchee, there's hundreds of feet of sediment, sand. Yes. Uh, you're probably talking about Pangborn Bar, if it's hundreds of feet thick, uh, it's where, which is where the airport is up there uh, across from across the river from Wenatchee. It's actually in East Wenatchee. Uh, I, th I think that's probably the, where the person's referring to. And that is an ancient flood bar from that, those very, that very earliest flood or floods that came down the Columbia from Lake Missoula before the Okanagan Lobe had blocked the Columbia River at where uh, Okanagan uh, Lobe is to, used to be. So it's from that very earliest flood about 18,000 years ago. Uh, you get that, that huge bar of sand uh, that formed uh, Bangborn Bar across from Wenatchee. I think that's, I think that answers, I'm hoping that answers the question. Bruce? Yes. Uh, do you have enough of a sense of uh, the mind of Harlan Bretz to answer whether uh, this question, why didn't he go crazy not knowing where the water came from? Uh, why didn't he just drive uh, him batty? That's a good question. Uh, I think he was so into the science. He didn't really need, you now he was very, uh, uh, he was very science-based and he just went around and collected information and took notes. And uh, he collected, he basically, he, after he collected all this data, then he, he tried to figure out, you know, what the, the explanation was. And he figured out it was a big flood based on what he had seen. So it's an inductive versus deductive reasoning. But I mean, it took, Pardee, it took Pardee to tell him where the water came from. Uh, well, Party was withholding that information for part of the time. But I mean, he didn't, he didn't know that it was Missoula and it didn't seem to bother him. Is that, that's a sense I get. Yeah, well, he, he didn't really need an explanation. Yeah, okay. yeah, he was, he was focused on the scab land and, and the areas downstream of the scab land so that he didn't, you know, he was basing all, he, at one time he thought maybe there was a volcanic eruption underneath the uh, Cordillera and ice sheet up in Canada that oh. might have produced. Well, he had, he had ideas like that, but he didn't really pursue those uh, very deeply. And I'm not sure he ever believed them. But, and plus he was kind of stubborn. He thought, he thought other people should just accept his, his line of reasoning and not need uh, a source for the water. But it did come, it did come eventually and he was vindicated. Yeah. Will there be another ice age? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Well, you know, over the last million years, there's been uh, 10, at least 10 ice ages. And they're usually about 100,000 years apart. If about half of that is ice age, the other half is interglacial periods like we have today. So it's been very cyclic for the last million years. They're probably from these Milankovitch cycles that we see that uh, affect the climate on a very regular basis. Uh, so whether will there be another ice age? Well, if there if it weren't if it, if it wasn't for us messing with the climate, I would say probably yes. But with us messing with the climate and what do we you know the things we've well, the climate has changed so rapidly, so recently. I'm not sure that'll happen. Or it's possible uh, it might push us into over a threshold and in, into an ice age sooner than previous cycles. There is evidence. Uh, there's some evidence that glacial war that uh, global or uh, warming, climatic warming, preceded ice ages in the past. Oh my gosh! So. I don't know. Let's come back in about 10,000 years and see. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thanks, Bruce, very much. Yeah, your, thank your, you. Your, your photos were absolutely stunning. Thank you. Just amazing. Uh, so as Bruce said, uh, he has a YouTube channel 
Uh, it's named Ice Age Floodscapes, but you also can just search on Bruce Bornstead and those will come up for you. Um, and so also visit the Ice Age Floods Institute website at www.iafi.org for information on membership to the Institute. And you also, uh, your, your membership fee is split between the Institute and a chapter that you would choose. And we would hope you would, if you're in the Cheney Spokane area, that you would become a member of the Cheney Spokane chapter. Uh, you also can see on the website that um, all of the events that are offered by the 11 chapters that are affiliated with the ISH Floods Institute. I uh, also want to let you know that this presentation again was report was recorded and will be available in a few days on the Cheney Spokane Chapters YouTube channel, uh, which is I Stage Floods, all one word, dash Cheney dash Spokane. And you can go back and, and see this exact same um, presentation uh, through the Cheney Spokane Chapters uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so I wanted to invite all of you to join us again on Thursday, November the 24th, when Michael Hamilton will present what happened when the dam burst. Thank you all for uh, joining us. We appreciate you coming into the channel. Tell your friends, uh, come into the next one. We uh, really appreciate having these uh, great presentations available via Zoom. Good evening. Thank you to you and to Bruce. Yep.